Yes, I left Kenya Thursday evening, their time, at 11.45 or something like that, and flew into JFK, arrived at JFK about, oh, 7.15 in the morning, and then I flew out of JFK around 10 o'clock and landed in Detroit about noon, maybe a little earlier than that. <coughs> and then my wife picked me up, and then we had a two and a half hour drive from there to home. We live in Sturgis, Michigan. <coughs> and then, um, so yeah, it was a crazy time. Uh, we usually figure when we go into Africa, most places we go, uh, from the time we leave our house and until the time we get to where we're going, it's a 24-hour period of time. That's the normal process. No matter which route we take, no matter how it works, it's at least that and maybe it could be a little longer depending on some of that. But um, So I don't think we'll have a problem this morning with the issue of jet lag and wanting to fall asleep at this point in time. Tonight might be a different story. Uh, because when I get here at 6, that would, my body clock is still over there in Kenya, and they're seven hours ahead of us. <clears throat> and my body would want to be saying, go to bed, go to bed, go to bed. Uh, but I can't go to bed, to bed, to bed, to bed, so I have to wait. <laughs> so uh, I have been, uh, the last two nights, I have been able to stay up to about 8, 8.30. And then I'd crash, and then I'd get up in the morning about 4.00 in the morning and feel pretty rested and so I praise the Lord for that and uh, thank the Lord we are missionaries with Word of Life and many of you know of the ministry of Word of Life <coughs> Word of Life is a mission organization uh, serving here in the United States uh, it has two Bible institutes in the United States two Bible institutes in Canada and a number of different Bible institutes all throughout the world. Uh, we are in 80 different countries around the world. And um, one of the things that I've had the privilege of, to do the last number of years is go into Uganda and teach at the African Bible Institute, World Life African Bible Institute in Uganda. Um, near um, the capital city there. And um, so I'm thankful for the opportunity to teach God's Word. This trip, I taught uh, theology courses, two of them. I taught bibliology and I taught Christology. And I noticed that on the information that on Wednesdays you're talking about Jesus and his character and some of those things. Uh, I apologize. My message this morning is also about Jesus. And it may have some similar things that maybe have already been taught or just reminders along the way. Uh, but uh, I trust it will be beneficial as well. Uh, Cindy and I, we live in Sturgis, Michigan. We were in South Africa for almost six years, serving there in the ministry. And uh, due to a number of reasons, but the main reason is her father is still alive, and he's uh, 90, and uh, he's still independent, though he's living on his own pretty much. But we... Uh, or come back to help uh, the siblings and everyone to kind of help get him to doctors and get him because he's hard of hearing and some other issues that we're dealing with and and just to just walk alongside him and to who knows when you know he he claims he's going to live until he's 96 97 or something and great if that's what god does that, that'd be awesome uh so we're not opposed to that uh so however god works that out but uh that's what we're doing what we do here in country is I am working with pastors here, just encouraging and challenging and helping them where I can, where they have a desire. And then also working uh, with churches, challenging uh, young adults and young people in different settings to just consider missions and consider Africa. So I have a more broader scope than just South Africa now. I have a scope that involves 11 different countries right now and more growing. More countries are expanding in, in our field. And so I have an opportunity to 
interact with that, those leaders in those countries and just come alongside them where they need assistance. So each country is a little different. And uh, they may need uh, some assistance in and just training some, some pastors. And maybe I can help. Or maybe I can give them the tools to help do that. So those kind of things. Um, <clears throat> and also, what is their staff needs? So when I'm working in colleges here and I'm talking to college students <clears throat> or I'm talking to churches and someone in the church says, I'd love to maybe get involved in missions. What are the needs in some of the countries in Africa? I can say, well... Uganda needs someone who can come and teach classes every week. <coughs> and I need, need an uh, in-house professor, someone to help teach theology. Um, I can say in South Africa, South Africa, the team needs a maintenance grounds person who can take care of the the buildings and facilities, and help train young men and women how to do basic maintenance skills. So those are things I know that team needs and other missionary needs as well. <coughs> so um, Kenya is always looking for additional missionary staff. Um, many of our staff needs are being met by Africans now. So that is huge. That is awesome. <coughs> and one of the things that Cindy and I get to be involved in is we get to be involved in interviewing some of these young people, young adults, young couples that want to come as part of the ministry of Word of Life Africa, and we get to interview them and help them walk through the process of hopefully at some point raising their support and being a missionary in Africa. So we help to interview them. Uh, interestingly, I had the privilege uh, a couple weeks back now to interview a gentleman, actually two gentlemen. One is from the Ivory Coast area, <coughs> so the western part of Africa. He speaks French, does not speak English. He can understand English a little. I'll tell you, it was an interesting interview. <laughs> said, well, how'd you do that? Well, we had a gentleman in France who was a friend of our ministry in France. He jumped on the Zoom call, and he helped interpret for us. So he would, the gentleman, I would ask a question. He would interpret in the French. <clears throat> the gentleman would respond in French, and the gentleman, he would interpret in English to me. Interestingly, English is not his first language, it's actually his third language <laughs> as well, the interpreter. <coughs> so that made the interview a little interesting and a little herky-jerky, you know. So we're trying to figure that thing out a little bit more and how to make that smoother and easier, both for the applicant and also for me. Um, and if any of you techie people have an idea of how that could happen, please let me know. Um, we're all ears and open for that, different ideas. Um, and they're... The paper application that he fills out is also in French. Hmm. Now, Google does translate some things, but even so, it's not the best. Okay, And so those are the realities. Tonight, uh, in the evening service, I'll show some slides of our ministry and our recent, my recent trip and what we were doing and uh, why I went, and all those kind of things. So we'll talk a little bit more about that tonight. So uh, we do have some special, they're, they're almost hot off the press, yeah. pictures of us, a yeah, little card, you know, <coughs> and our family on the back. Everyone's in this family except one. My oldest grandson was sick when this picture was taken, and uh, somehow I didn't prop him in. So, But anyway, um, we have nine grandsons, by the way. No daughters, so no granddaughters. And the Lord's blessed us with that. And uh, But if you'd like a card, my wife has some that we'll have available. We'll leave some here at the church um, for you to pick up and take with you. My only request is, I don't care where you put it, as long as you see it from time to time and you pray for us, okay? 
You may look at the picture and say, hmm, that's a good picture to keep mice away. Okay, do whatever you got to do. I don't care. Just remember to pray for us. All right? That's all right. <coughs> all right. Enough for all of that. If you have questions, we'll be here throughout the day, and we'll be happy to answer any questions you have and how we can uh, do that. All right. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you that you are God. You're worthy of our worship and praise. Thank you for reminding us of this, even in our songs this morning. And Lord, I now invite and ask that the Holy Spirit would uh, take your word, open our hearts and minds, give us clarity of thought, and may you just uh, stir our hearts to love you, to know you, to walk with you, and to be all that you want us to be for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning I want to talk about Jesus. I want to talk about Jesus, the God-man. The God-man. Have you ever noticed it doesn't take long for something that we think of as special, unique, something that we would hold dear to ourselves and we'd say, well, this is really special to me. For to just in a short amount of time, to become just common, just ordinary, just mundane. You know, like a new car. You know, you get that new car and it has that new car smell. I've only had one in my life, so I don't really know what that's like. But, <clears throat> um, but that new car or that special heirloom that's handed down from one generation to the next. Or some of you younger ones, that toy. That toy that you just received at Christmas or birthday or... And it just takes maybe a, a day or two even. And pretty soon it's just, oh, well, it's just a toy. It's just no big deal. It's just, oh, yeah, that's my old truck now, you know. Uh, I don't, it doesn't matter. Just throw whatever you want in there, you know. And it just becomes mundane. But what about Jesus? I think it's possible. I think it's possible then in our understanding and in our concept about Jesus, that's, there's been times, and maybe it's, it's true in your life right now, the word Jesus, you talk about Jesus, and it's like, well, I know about Jesus. I learned about that in Sunday school. I, you know, it's just commonplace. No really big deal. What's the big deal about Jesus? Well, today, I want us to... Just be excited and, and renewed in our understanding of who Jesus is. And just uh, allow the wonder about Jesus to maybe re-excite us a little bit, okay? About who he is. So this morning, here in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and then also in verse 14, we're going to look at some things about Jesus we're going to look through the eyeglass of Scripture to gain a new and fresh glimpse of this Jesus, whom we call Savior and Lord. So if you will turn with me <clears throat> to the Gospel according to John. And I'm going to read something that I, I pulled up from um, Matthew Henry's commentary, if I can uh, find it here quickly. <clears throat> Let me read these verses, and then I'll bring old Matthew Henry into it. Anybody remember who Matthew Henry is? Some of you are nodding your head. He was long, long ago before your time. He was a pastor, commentary, and we have his commentaries uh, still with us today. Um, so back in the 1500s, somewhere in that neighborhood, okay? Long time ago. I'm not that old. Uh, young people, trust me, I'm not. I'm really, a, I'm really not. Okay? Listen to God's Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him, not even one thing <coughs> came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of mankind, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not grasp it. 
And then in verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. We talk about in the beginning was the word, was the word. Matthew Henry says this in regards to the word. He says the word, hoglogos, this is the idiom peculiar to John's writing. So John wrote and used this word quite often. Here in the, in the book of John, in 1 John, he, he does it. Also in Revelation, he does this. Um, <clears throat> and so he uses this term. But this word logos, or logos, there's two aspects to it in the Greek. The first one is, has the meaning of the word is conceived. So it has more to do with the internal word. So within God, within Christ, Christ is the internal word of God. So you and I have this internal word. We have the ability to think things, and that's our internal word. And internally, we speak to ourselves, don't we? We may not say anything verbally, but internally, we are talking ourselves. You ever had a conversation with yourself? You know, you, yourself, and I? Or I, myself? Yeah, never mind. You have this conversation sometimes, and you're thinking about things. This is, this is one aspect when, when it refers to, in the beginning was this word, the word this internal interaction that was happening. The second thing is what we normally think about when we think about the Logos is the, the word uttered. It's the aspect of something being uttered. And Jesus is, is that. Uh, when in Genesis 1, and when God spoke, we understand that the word that was given, this is Jesus at work here. Because in Colossians it says, and even here in this passage, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was, it was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, through Christ. And Colossians says that He spoke, and these things came to pass. He is the Creator. So when we think about God, Jesus as God, Jesus as God. We have to, these verses very clearly, very specifically identify Jesus as God. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos, Jesus. And the Word was with God. Jesus Christ is the Logos or the person, He's the perfect manifestation of God. The Word. Logos here, the word expresses precisely God's thoughts and plans, not only in concrete terms, but also as a living personal term. So Jesus is this living personal representation of God. And more so in the context now in his humanity. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Hebrews 1, 2 says it like this. I'll turn there quickly. It talks about Jesus being the express image of God. It says this. God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many different ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the world, and he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. At least twice in this passage, it talks about Jesus as the word. He's the word. He's the exact representation of God the nature of God.
in the beginning. God was there at the very beginning. Jesus was there with God, and Jesus created this world. That's what 1 1 says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, what's it say? Was God. The Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, they twist that. And they, their Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. That's how they say it in their Bibles. <coughs> it's not accurate. Jesus was very God. He's always been God. Jesus has. Now, he wasn't referred to as Jesus way back there. He was just referred to as God, God the Son. God the Son, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. There, there was this relationship, the three in one. <coughs> and there, in 26 of Genesis, the God, God says, let us make man. <coughs> Who's he talking to? Well, there's some different ideas about who that is. But we believe that this is talking about the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They're talking to each other. That internal word going on. (coughs) And they said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And so on and so forth. Jesus Christ has always been. The question comes, and I had it even this <coughs> last couple of weeks, where did God come from? Um, <coughs> if anybody has an answer, please let me know. He's always been. That's why he's God. He has always been, and he's always existed. Jesus Christ is pre-existent one. (coughs) He's always been. And the word was with God, it says. (coughs) What I want you to see from that, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, is that there's a distinction between the Father and the Son. The Word was with God. There's a distinction. We believe that there's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, three in one, who equally are of equal value, equal power, and equal authority, the same essence, and yet they function and able to function separately. (coughs) Do I understand that? No. I have nothing in this world to compare it to, to bring it to light and go, oh, this is what that means. Any illustration I would even provide for you would be minuscule as to really what that represents. And so I choose not to try to even explain it in that context because it would not bear uh, a complete representation of it. Jesus is an independent divine person in <coughs> excuse me in fellowship with the Father coexistent co-equal eternal with God the Father and the word was God he is not simply divine but he is God he is God of gods that's why Thomas after Jesus resurrection And all the other apostles said, we've seen Jesus. He's alive. He's risen. (coughs) And Thomas says, no, I don't believe it. I won't believe it unless I see him. I can put my fingers into his side. I can see the nail prints in his hands. I will not believe. A few days later, Thomas is with all the other disciples there in John 20. And Jesus appears in their midst. And all of a sudden, Jesus looks at Thomas and says, Thomas, don't be unbelieving. 
but see and believe. Blessed are those who will believe and not see. <laughs> and Thomas, what did he do? He says, <laughs> I, don't need to, I don't need to touch anything. I don't, he, just say, he just bowed on his knees and he said this, my Lord and my God. He acknowledged Jesus as God. This, this declaration, my Lord and my God, this is what John's gospel is all about. We read it there in chapter 20 of John, verses 30, 31, 32, where he says, I write these things unto you so that you may know and understand that Jesus truly is God. I paraphrased, okay? That's, this is the height of John's declaration. His, this gospel he wrote under the direction and inspiration of the Holy Spirit to reveal and identify that Jesus is God. And that Jesus truly came in the flesh. <clears throat> He's God. There is, when you think about Jesus... You know, we, we kind of in our minds, we have this concept of Jesus as this little baby born in a manger, born there in Bethlehem, and it's just so sweet and special and nice and, and uh, it just wonderful. But we need to get our, our minds wrapped around the fact that Jesus, this one who was born in that manger, this one has always been has existed forever, and he is God. He is God. The all-powerful one, the all-knowing one, the ever-present one, the God of love, the God of holiness, the God of justice. He is God. Get your mind wrapped around that truth. He is God. In every aspect... He is the creator. He is the one who, by the word of his mouth, sustains everything, holds it all together. You say, well, no, 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 that's gravity. That's all this other stuff around. That's just natural, normal things. Who holds gravity in place? Who designed this world to function and to operate the way it does and by his word continues to keep it there in its place? Jesus does. God does. That's who we're talking about here. This is God. So one of the things I'm, I'm hoping that when you hear the word Jesus, that your mind will automatically, quickly go boom, and you'll say, that's God. This is the God of the universe. This is the one who created me. This is the one who knew me even before I was formed in my mother's womb. This is the one who made me to who I am today. This is the one who took my place on the cross. This is the one that arose from the grave because he's God. Any man can die, but no man can live a sinless life and die and rise again by his own power and by his own authority. Only God. See, that's the point we're trying to make here. Jesus is God. Don't let anyone tell you or represent in any way something different. If in our theology and in our thinking... And our understanding of God's word, we lower Jesus to being less than God, then we have not done justice to the word of God, and we haven't represented him well. Jesus is fully God. That's the way we would say this. He is fully God. Jesus made the claim, I and the Father are one, John 10:30. When Jesus said these words, I am before Abraham, and the Jewish religious leaders, they understood it 
to mean that Jesus was equating and declaring that he was God and they wanted to kill him because they believed that he was blaspheming because he was acknowledging and declaring that he was God. And it's right on. He is God. But he's also fully man. Fully God and also fully man. We call this the incarnation. Where God took upon flesh and became man. The word, the logos of God The Word became man. He became fully man without losing being fully God. He was fully God while here on earth, and he was fully man. Today, he is both fully God and fully man. Let me walk our way through this a little bit. (coughs) Excuse me. Look at verse 14. Let's back up to verse 10. Oh, let's just start with verse 9. This was the true light that coming into the world enlightens every person. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, and yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not accept him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as the, of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the incarnation. You can read about it in Luke, the first couple chapters. You can read about it in Matthew, the first couple chapters, where it says that the Holy Spirit came upon Mary, a virgin, and she was with child. The virgin birth is important. Why? Because it means that he came from God, but he also was fully human, without a sin nature yet without sin. The incarnation. Galatians 4.4. 4. You could turn there if you would, please. Here the Apostle Paul reminds us <clears throat> in regards to this time when Jesus came. And it says, <clears throat> But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law and that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters. Because we are son, you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. In the fullness of time, God sent his son, born of a woman. People get a little confused when, you know, like you read John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, only begotten son. What does that mean? Or another place in scripture where he's the firstborn of all creation. It isn't an issue of time that's represented there. It's an issue of uniqueness and specialness. Jesus did not become God in the incarnation. He's always been. And as God, and and that relationship as son, that's always been there. And God, you you just just imagine if you would. And we we don't know exactly, the scripture doesn't tell us exactly how it all came about. What all happened in the Godhead. Except we do know that our redemption was planned before the beginning of time. And so somewhere in the, in the Godhead, they, they came up with this plan, knowing that man was going to sin, they were going to create man, 
Man was going to sin, and somebody within the Godhead had to go and take on flesh and die for man's sin and rise again to give man life. And Jesus, I don't know if this actually happened like this, but I, I, this is my little brain thinking. And Jesus goes, I'll go. I'll go. Left all of heaven's glory. Emptied himself in the sense that he willingly chose to limit his, his abilities as God for a period of time while he was here on earth and only do what the Father commanded him to do and live and learn under obedience as a man, as the God-man, to ultimately become our Savior and Lord. Became flesh. Made of a woman. What does that mean? What does that mean? It means that Jesus was a man just like you and I with bones and flesh and with mind and will and emotion and all the things that we deal with in a human context. He was limited in time and space. That's why Jesus said to his disciples, I must go away so that I can send the comforter, so I can send the helper, because this helper will not be restricted by the physical anymore, like I am right now. Jesus was hungry. He got tired. He wept. He experienced joy. <coughs> All these things he, he dealt with just like you and I. And as a body, as a man, he was mortal. And could die. That's an important distinction here. As a human, he could die. His life could be taken from him. Now we know he willingly gave it up. But he literally died. This wasn't just a you know, spiritual concept that he died. No, he physically died. So, this gentleman right now is in hospice. He, this gentleman has not yet experienced physical death. I haven't either. I don't really know what that is. I don't know what that's like. I don't I really, I don't know. Jesus has. And guess what? Jesus, as the high priest, Jesus is with this gentleman who's professed Christ as Savior. He's with him today ministering to him and helping him. Isn't that awesome? Because Jesus knows what death is like. And he can fully help that individual completely. I can only imagine what it is. But Jesus knows. Why? Because he was fully man. He knows it says that Jesus dwelt among us there in John 1, 14. Dwelt among us. Came and lived among us. Didn't just, you know, passing through, whoop, gone. <clears throat> we don't know a lot about his early, the 30 years before his ministry. We have little snippets, we have little ideas, but all that happened in those 30 years, we don't know. We think, we assume that Joseph somewhere in there that 30 years died, his, his stepdad. But there's a lot we don't know. But whatever it was, he experienced life just like you and I do. He knew what it was to work every day, to become tired, have to go to sleep. He knew what it was to be hungry and need to eat. We see this in John chapter 4. We see it in other passages. Okay? He came, and he dwelt among us. In other words, he came, and he took off his coat, and he stayed a while. If you can use, use that little analogy. And he was amongst men, and he was a man. 
<clears throat> he's not always been a man, but he now is perpetually a man. When he was resurrected, his body was changed, glorified, just like one day we're going to be resurrected if we put our faith and trust in Christ, and our bodies are going to be glorified, changed. This mortal take on immortality. That's how Jesus is right now. Awesome stuff. As God... Jesus is, was and is the dwelling place, is the physical representation of God to, to mankind. And yet, as a man, he was fully without sin. He was tempted like we are. He understands all that you and I experience when it comes to temptation. He's been tempted in all points, as Hebrew says, like we are, yet without sin. Hebrews 4, 15. Jesus, the Logos, the Word, He is the God-man. The God-man. There in John 1, 18, it says, No one has seen God at any time. God, the only Son, who is in the arms of the Father, he has explained or declared him to us, this Jesus. That's why Jesus in John 14, when he's asked the question, <clears throat> where are you going? And Jesus says to his disciples, you know, I go away to prepare a place for you, and when I come again, I'll receive you unto myself. And... Uh, <laughs> one of the disciples there says, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How do we know the way? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And now you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to them, have I been with you all this time, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? I am God, and yet I am fully man. I have declared God. I have revealed him to you. I am the very personification and the very embodiment of God to you. Fully in character and in will and in wisdom and in power, I am God. You say, well, wow, that's cool. Jesus is God, fully God. Whew, he's fully man. So what? What has that got to do with me today? Let me give you some, some reasons. One is, I already mentioned it kind of, Hebrews 4, 15. We have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses, understands our temptations, and yet he was without sin. <clears throat> Why is that important? Because it was through the, Jesus Christ being fully God and fully man, those two becoming one, that he could then deal with your sin and my sin on the cross. And in his resurrection, give life to all who believe. Without him being God, this could not happen. Without him being man, this could not happen. He had to be both God and man to bring about redemption and provide redemption for you and I. It's a pretty big reason why it's important for us today. Because if you're here today and you do not know Jesus as your Savior and Lord, only Jesus can save your soul. Only Jesus. This God-man. Only Jesus. That's why it's so important. It's a test <coughs> to weed out false teachers and, and those who claim. John also says in John, 1 John 4 that
that any spirit, anyone who comes, to con- and they do not confess that Jesus came in the flesh, is not someone you ought to listen to. It's a test. <clears throat> fully God, fully man. But Scripture says this there in John 1, 12. But as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Because of who Jesus is. Because of what he did as the God-man, anyone, all, who put their faith and trust in Jesus can be made right with God. That's the God-man. And he's the one that brings that together. He brought it together, this God-man concept, into himself. But he's also the one that brings us. If we in faith trust Christ, we can be brought in a right relationship with God. And we can have abundant life because of him. Let's bow and let's pray. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let me ask you a question. Who is Jesus to you? Who do you say he is? Is he just a nice guy? Someone who lived, you know, thousands of years ago? Yeah, he did some really good things. He taught some good things. Is he God? Is he fully man? And what does that mean for you? Will you be like Thomas, who says, my Lord and my God, my Lord and my God. Maybe you're here and you need to trust Christ as Savior. I just invite you to do that right now. You say, I know I'm a sinner. I know I, I, I can do nothing to earn God's favor. But right now I want to trust Jesus as my Savior. You do it. You do it right now. Just say, Lord, you're right. I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. And my only hope is Jesus. And I believe that he died for my sin, and he was buried, and he rose again to give me life. And right now I trust him as my Savior and Lord. And if you'll do that, God promises. God's word says, whosoever will may come. And if you will believe, you'll become a part of his family. Do it right now. And if you do that, tell someone before you leave today. Tell a friend next to you. Tell your spouse. Tell, tell you know, one of the guys by the door. Tell someone. You can tell me if you like. But telling me and telling them doesn't save you. Only your belief and faith in Jesus Christ and what he did. That's what saves you. But believer, what about you? Are you walking and living in an in a atmosphere and an idea and, and an understanding that Jesus Christ took your place and wants to give you life and life more abundant and wants to help you to live out the things of Christ day by day? He understands. He knows your struggles. He's not there to beat you up. He's there to lift you up. Will you let him? And just acknowledge his presence in your life. Father, you know us. You know our very hearts. And we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he's always been. We thank you that he left heaven's glory and took upon flesh so that he could reconcile us back to you. We worship you, we praise you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.